Heavenly Father, at the beginning of this new year, we pray <clears throat> that we may hear what you have to say to us through your word. We pray that you will give us the courage to take these things into ourselves and to live as you ask us to. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please sit down. <clears throat> Some years ago, in the 1970s, I had a lot to do with a man who had spent... Um, a considerable amount of his time out in India. He had gone out to India and actually to Nepal as well uh, to work with uh, a fledgling Christian organization, working with young people who were making the journey to the East, looking for fulfillment. <clears throat> and this man had had a, a, a tremendous time while he was out in India. Um, it had been a good move for him. He found himself growing very rapidly as a Christian, that he got on well with the colleagues that he'd gone to work with, with the Bible studies and the prayer meetings that they had together in the community that they had, the church that they went to. All of these things were very auspicious for him. <clears throat> and he found himself, uh, from a position of, of being quite a young Christian, moving through the groups that he was in until he had considerable responsibility within them. But the time came when his time in India had to draw to a close. He returned to this country, he went, came to live in the city where I at that time lived and I got to know him for several reasons fairly well and we went to the same church. And as the months went by, I began to become increasingly worried about him because it was quite clear Although he had a substantial amount of his life still ahead of him, most of the time seemed to be spent looking back at what had happened in India. That all the examples of uh, what you did as a Christian seemed to come out of this Indian context. That whatever had happened in England to him since that time somehow didn't measure up to what he had done in India. Somehow the church in this country was never quite up to it. There was always something wrong. And there was this deep-seated longing inside as it were to be back in central New Delhi or in Kathmandu. Over time, I moved on to something else. I've lost touch with him. I don't know where he is now. But it would be interesting to find out. Because I saw very graphically in his life something which actually happens, or which can happen, to a lot of Christians. We stand at the beginning of a new year. A new year which contains a lot of hopes for many of us, which is going to be different for some of us because of what we experienced last year. And we need to listen, I think, to what God is saying to us at this moment. Because we are very <clears throat> susceptible to the temptation that I've just described. The temptation to feel 
that something which God led us through in the past is somehow the summit of everything that we'll ever do with God. And that having lived through that, it isn't going to come back. Now, why is this important? Well, it is because it's easy to feel that our experience of church works that way. That somehow, when, you know, X person, and you can fill in the name, when that person was the vicar here, <laughs> things were rather better than they are now. Or when I had that job in the past, everything was great. When I lived in this place, but I don't do those things anymore. That's not the case anymore. Somehow, God isn't what he used to be. Now, we should ask ourselves, does God want us to think that way? How does God want us to deal with these things? Because we can't help feeling the way that we do about some of those things. We can't change that. So how do we approach it? Well, I think we're given some very, very interesting pointers in that Hebrews reading that John brought to us a few moments ago. And we see something about the faith that Abraham has, which teaches us a lesson about how to confront those moments so that we don't start thinking in 2013, well, we, we seem to be part of a church that's gone into decline and things aren't quite the way that they were when we did things here in the past and what are we going to do now that Heidi's leaving? Yeah, some of you have asked yourself those questions, haven't you? And God, I think, has an answer for us. Now, we know the story of Abraham, the idol worshipper who lived in Ur of the Chaldees, who had an incredible revelation of God, who told him to leave that place and to follow him and to go not knowing where he was going. And the writer to the Hebrews writes about this. and He says, well, Abraham left Ur to follow God God had made him promises. God promised to give him a land. God promised to give him wealth. God promised to give him descendants, a son that he didn't have. And in his lifetime, he received so much of that from God. He was a fortunate man who experienced the faithfulness of God in a very direct way that God actually gave him those things. But the writer to the Hebrews says we have to be careful of how we read that story. In verse 9 he says, By faith Abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob. In other words, Abraham received what God promised him. He got to the land that God was giving him. But when he got there, he didn't think, fantastic, you know, thank you God, I put down roots here. He didn't do any of that. He didn't build any cities. He lived in the place that God gave him as if it was a foreign country. Saying all the time, God may have given me this, but it's not my home. Why? Well, verse 10 tells us, for because he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. He knew that this patch of land in the Middle East was not 
God's ultimate. It, it had a lot to offer him. It was great because he received it. It was truly his. But he didn't sit down and think to himself, thank you God for giving me all that you have to give me. There was nothing like that. He knew that there was a lot more waiting for him, but that he had to operate by faith. And it's not described to us, it's just tantalizingly described by the writer to the Hebrews as the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. He knew that God had a not yet as well as a now. And then he goes on to talk about Abraham being past age and Sarah being barren, and yet God gave them a son. And as he did that, he was prepared to believe that God could do the impossible. And that in his lifetime, he actually saw it happen. And, you know, can we imagine what that must have been like, that this man who was... Uh, so old and considered himself to be at the end of his life, looks at this newborn son and thinks, you know, goodness me, God promised me that all of those years ago. He's done the impossible. Is there any more that this God can do? But the writer to the Hebrews goes on. And he says, all these people were still living by faith when they died? When they died? They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens, aliens and strangers on earth. Is it nice being an alien? That's what God says you are. We used to sing this song in Sunday school, didn't we, about, you know, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? But, you know, it, it sort of trivialised it a bit. But this is the thrust of what it's saying. That Abraham, although he was prepared to trust God in the now, and although he received God's gifts in the now, although he saw God doing the impossible in the now, was not so committed to the now that he lost touch with the not yet of God. And so we're warned not to make that mistake, because Abraham didn't make it, faith meant that he had to live with God's not yet and continue doing so right through his life. And to say, however good this gets, I've got a land, I've got wealth, I've got a son I could never have expected, however good that gets, it's not God's ultimate for me. And I think that was the mistake that my friend made. He thought that in India he'd hit God's ultimate. It couldn't get any better than that. But I think God was saying to him, yes, it can. <laughs> Provided you keep your eye on the prize. And you might doubt it in the interim. But it's true. The story of all God's people shows us that this is true. Instead, it says in verse 16, they, God's people who live by faith, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, because they're longing for a better country, because they're longing for God's not yet, Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Dare I say, for us.
What God has prepared for you and me is exciting in the immediate now, and it's even more exciting in the not yet that he has for us. In the same way that Abraham saw the impossible happening before his eyes, God can do that again. It's not a problem. And the not yet that he has waiting for us is so much better than that. And the challenge for us is to learn to live with that faith. Because the temptation that we're subject to is always to go the way of my friend. And the way of people that I've seen in churches all over this land. There was one occasion... I've probably told you this story before, but Julie and I used to lead a home group in the church where, where, uh, we, we, from which we were sent to the ministry. And every week in the Bible study, there was a woman who sort of used the, the name of a, a previous curate and said, you know, when, when XX, this curate, was here, we used to do this. And every week we waited with bated breath for this contribution in the Bible study because it was always there. <coughs> now the man concerned was an incredibly gifted minister. Still around. <laughs> but he wasn't God's ultimate. And, you know, when I've gone, if any of you start going around saying, when John Rayner was here, you know, I hope God does something serious to you. <laughs> but do you, are you getting this? Do you understand what I'm saying? That when the new year comes round and we start thinking, oh, goodness me, you know, we... We weigh it up for ourselves and we think, well, the circumstances are against us. We're part of a church which nationally is in decline and which keeps getting its knickers in a twist or its gaiters in the ringer about something or other. You know, there's not so many people in church as there used to be. And our staff are clearing off to Wakefield Cathedral. And okay, I can trivialise it that way, but can you see what we're doing, folks? We're falling into the temptation of thinking that we've had God's ultimate and that he hasn't got anything left. Whereas the opposite is true, that he wants us to see that these things that we've had and that we've experienced and the impossible stuff we've seen before our eyes, that these are his gifts to us and they're fantastic but compared to the not yet that's coming, they just pale into insignificance. I don't know what God's going to do this year. I wish I had that gift of prophecy and could tell you. All I know is that God wants us to believe that he can do more this year than he's done in our experience ever. That he's that kind of God and that he wants us to live holding on to that faith in the not yet that we may actually not receive during our lifetimes here on earth but which we will receive because he has said it. And the place to start actually is where that gospel reading comes in. And I'm not going to expound that gospel reading now, other than to make just one point about it. And you remember it, the story of the guy who's, uh, whose land brought forth so much that he couldn't contain it, and he said, I'll pull down my barns and build greater... Uh, and I'll be able to, to, to eat, drink, and be merry for the rest of my life. And God said to him, your life's ending tonight, mate. You're a fool. Now, that is a story about wealth. But actually, 
it's not just a story about wealth, because it's gospel. It applies to us all. And it's the same thing, actually, that I've been talking about. That when good things happen to us, something kicks in in us which makes us want to keep it. And we think, oh, this is so fantastic that we've got to keep it this way for as long as possible. You know, I I go to this fantastic church. The Bible studies that I go to are wonderful. There's so much prayer going on. It's a generous place. The people are so friendly. I wouldn't go to another church if you paid me. And I want it to stay like that forever and ever and ever. Now, we don't literally say that, of course, because we wouldn't. But sometimes we're thinking that. I don't want to lose this. It's fantastic. I've worked hard for it. But isn't that what that man was saying? I don't want to lose this because I've worked hard for it. God's blessed me with this, so I'm going to pull me barns down and I'll build bigger ones and I'll be okay. And God says, you're a fool. And this is about God giving prosperity. What should he have done? Well, he should have given it all away, shouldn't he? I I just want to bless others with this because I can't possibly contain it. And, And that's what he should have done. And so this is what we do. If our church is great, well, let's share it with as many people as possible. Let's give it away. You know, we want everyone else to share this. You know, if if, if my home group is, is such a great place, well, why don't all the people who've learned so much about what it is to be in a great home group, why don't you all become home group leaders? Then 12 times as many people can have the blessing Oh, it doesn't work like that, John. We've worked really hard to get our home group in the place that we want it. Hang on a minute. You know, if you try to keep it and build a a little wall around it, you'll lose it and God will call you a fool. Isn't that what that parable says? Mm. 2013. The year of blessing others. Oh, what a great prayer. Where the things that we have learned over the years and which have been God's gift to us here, we just start giving them away. Yeah. And if the community around here started thinking of us, you know, the church that gives everything away. Now, I know it's not as straightforward as that. But I wonder whether God does want us to think about some of these things. That especially as some of us get older, this very difficult temptation kicks in about wanting to keep what we've got. And it's not just a disease of getting older. I, I, so I don't mean that. It's just human, I think. And where we detect that happening, let's be careful to remember that God wants us to have our eyes on the not yet, so that we live like Abraham did, appreciating all that God has done and given in the present, but understanding that that can't possibly be the summit of all that he wants to do and to give us. Let us live holding on to a vision of God's not yet, Let's just try to bless as many people as we can with what we have. And let's pray that what we see this year 
or what we expect God to do this year will be far beyond anything that we've so far asked or imagined.